D. Mateo. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Quinny Clem with Quinny's Book Talk and Reviews, and I am your literary ambassador. And today I have Luca D. Mateo on my channel today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, Queenie. How are you today? Fine. How are you? Now tell us a little about yourself. Well, Queenie, before I wrote Greenhaven, uh, I was a doctor for 28 years. And what happened was in 2018, I hurt my back very badly. And I mostly worked in nursing homes. And so bending over uh, was out of the question. So I, I retired. I always had a love of writing. I uh, ran a website and wrote a lot for that. Did some articles here and there. Even in the beginning of my practice, uh, I had a local uh, paper who picked up a, um, an article I ran uh, every two weeks. But after retiring, I really wanted to write a book. And so I wrote Greenhaven um, right here. And uh, so Greenhaven is a, a mystery suspense thriller. And it has to do with, now, I wrote the book in 2018 in about four months. And it took till 2020 for it to come out. Uh, as you know, the editing and the publishing road is a long one. Mm -hmm. um, but Greenhaven uh, is three story lines that twist and turn into each other um, to come up with a, uh, a wonderful story. Of what I believe characters who are really flawed and really, they just look like normal people. But the main character, Kathy Arden, is a director of nursing at an upscale nursing home called Greenhaven. And she starts to notice that patients are dying a little more quickly than they should be. And she starts to investigate. And as she does, she finds out that everything points to her. And she now has to figure out who's, who in the nursing home might be doing it. And that person, that killer could be working right next to her. And she has no idea who it is. And so as the story un unwinds, she has to go through all this process and figure it out who it is. And when she first started working at Greenhaven, she was ready to change the world. And after a few things that happened to her, she's kind of stuck her head in the sand. And now she's forced to come back and deal with life. Um, that's the main story. There's another story that twists into it that the um, director, the medical director of the nursing home, um, is having a relationship with the owner. And they believe they're keeping it a secret to maintain her position, but she's hiding an even be it bigger secret from him. And that all intertwines into the story. Then the final, the final twist, the final storyline is about the young nun and priest who service the place and how they're twisted into it. And um, I've challenged people to figure out who's, who is the mastermind behind it. And I love getting the uh, emails and the text messages and, and all the little uh, messenger stuff about people telling me, oh, I thought it was this person and this happened and that happened. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been a good road. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is your genre and what's, what attracted you, you to this genre? Well, it's a, it's a mystery suspense thriller. And I more or less think it's a medical thriller myself. They say, write what you know. Being a doctor for 28 years, working in nursing homes for all that time, it's what I know. And so that's why it takes place in and around the nursing home. The nursing home is really just the backdrop. It's about, it's about the characters and how they intertwine with one another and react. Okay. How many books have you published? This is actually my second book. My wife and I published a little mini book um, about 11 years ago. And it was a 32-page tiny little book, uh, more of about self-awareness and self uh, personal growth. Uh, but this is the second one. I have a third one in the works now and a fourth one behind that. So, oh, wow. Yes, I, I've been quite busy. <laughs> yes, yes. What was the inspiration behind Green Haven? Um, honestly, it was a dream. Came in the middle of the night. And I decided to start writing it. And next thing I knew, I had two chapters. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in the middle of the night all night long mm -hmm. and uh, writing and writing and writing. And it, it kind of just, the characters just started talking to me and I couldn't even write fast enough. I can tell you how many times, can't even tell you how many times 
I went back into the story and found words I had left out or things that didn't make sense because one character was talking and then the next character would jump into my head. And so it took a lot of refinement. Mm -hmm. I've learned to work with that in my second novel um, and in the third. So it's, it's, it's been a little easier, but it seems to come to me in what I call the in-between. That point where you're just about to fall asleep and you're still awake and you all of a sudden your mind starts to relax and you get the creative juices flowing. Mm -hmm. To me, that's when it just starts flowing out of me. Okay. How long have you been an author? Uh, since February of, oh, well, I guess technically forever. <laughs> okay. So I, I, forever. <laughs> When did you decide to become an author? Um, when I really just wanted to do that, uh, I had the book start coming into mind and then I said, I think I can do this. I, mm -hmm. I started to write, and quite honestly, Green ha writing Greenhaven was, was my sanity. Uh, I went from a very busy practice where I was up and running all day long, you know, 14, 16 hours. And all of a sudden I couldn't do anything. I could barely get out of bed. And then I, then I had to do something. My mind still needed to exercise. It still needed to, to, to flex its muscle. And the story started coming and it's the only thing that kept me sane. Oh, wow. How do you develop your plot and characters? Well, I, I, it's, it's, I'm glad you asked that because the plot seems to unwind itself. I have a general beginning, middle, and end in my mind. I'm not like most authors. A lot of authors write outlines. I don't, but I do write character background. Um, what I do is I will start with a character and I will build that character, family, relationships, job, social life. And I'll build a, a 3D or 4D even character. And I do that for all the main characters, a little less for some of the supporting characters. Um, and, and what I call the, just the, the cameo characters kind of just, I wing them uh, a lot of the time. But what happens is that allows me, when I, I write a lot of dialogue in, in, in my stories. And so I get a better sense how they're going to react when I have a full background for them. And a, a lot of times I don't, I don't go back and have to look at the backgrounds too much after writing them, I have a pretty good sense of what the character is like. Throughout the years of seeing so many patients and dealing with so many people, um, you know, a lot of my characters are a mashup of people and of, of their, their emotions and their senses and things of that nature. Uh, I pay very, very careful attention to not make any character any one particular person. Uh, that I don't want to happen. I have to actually go out of my way to find names for my characters that I don't know anybody with those names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the most important elements of a good story? The story has to be first and foremost feasible. It has to have, you have to do research for the story. You can't write a story and have a lot of holes in it or things that are unbelievable. Um, for me, uh, you know, I don't write fantasy. I don't write sci-fi. So for me, I have to stay in that lane. I have to fact check. So when I put something in my, in my books, in my stories, I try to make sure they're authentic for the time period, uh, for what that character would be going through. Um, that, me, that to me makes it more relatable. The other thing is characters have to have strengths and shortcomings. They have to be relatable to people. You have to say, oh, I know somebody like that. Or that feels like me. The story has to talk to the reader. Okay. Would you like to share a snippet from your book? Oh, gosh. Uh, sure, I'd love to. I hadn't planned on that, but uh, okay. Let me, how about if I just pick it at random? I'll open the page and we'll see where we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So... Let me just see where we are here. Um, one of the characters who is the, um, the um, director at the nursing home, he, the administrator, he is leaving for a couple of days, but no one knows why he's really leaving. 
uh, which in and of itself brings up some suspicion. But here's a little excerpt um, about him leaving the office. And um, what, what that meant was that Kathy, the main character now was in charge and she's receiving, um, or no, I'm sorry. She's the main character in this particular scene. She's been told to sit at his office and there's some turmoil between, between Kyle, the administrator and Kathy, the director of nursing. She's done something he can't forgive. And I'm not gonna let, I'm not gonna tell you what that was. Okay. okay. Um, but now she's been asked to sit at his desk and um, because he wants to portray that somebody in charge is at the front office, that's sitting in front. Um, and she's on her way this, this morning there. At 6.45 a.m., Kathy arrived at Greenview. She wanted to enter early, but not early enough to attract any attention. She reached her office and, filed, and fired up the computer. On the, on the drive-in, on the drive in, she had concluded that certain that creating a blank spreadsheet, I'm sorry, this is a different chapter, but <laughs> what she's trying to do now is she's trying to figure out what's going on, but not leave a trail behind. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. uh, on the drive-in, she had concluded that creating a blank spreadsheet using, a pro using the program on the computer would be okay. It wouldn't mean anything to anybody. Um, thank you, thank you, detective shows. I should back up. Kathy's a big fan of watching detective shows. You know, detective dramas on television. So, in order to find out what she needs to find out, she's pulling a lot of that, a lot of that information she's learned through these TV shows into here, and it gets kind of funny after a while as she does this stuff, and then realizes this was a good move or a bad move, and mm -hmm. and she's in turmoil because sometimes she thinks that she should do something, and the television show says no, or the television show says yes, and she thinks. She should do it. <laughs> Um, and there are some funny things. I like to write just subtle humor into it. Um, and for instance, there's a detective who's chasing her who can't find, continually can't find the right usage of a word and everybody he seems to meet corrects him. Um, oh, wow. And he's, and he's just getting, and he's grumpy and, and semi-retired almost. And he's just grumpy about it. And every time someone brings it up, he, he just gets more angry. So... Um, the spreadsheet covered the entire page when printed out. The, bo the boxes were big enough so she could, this is kind of a, um, I, I don't want to read this section. <laughs> okay. You mind if I pick another one? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I'd like to get to, you kind of caught me off guard here a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, Okay, we're gonna we're we're gonna go to uh, actually I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and tell you about Oscar. Oscar Green owns owns the nursing home. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, Dr. Marissa Oliver is the medical director that he's trying to uh, keep a relationship with. And um, Oscar was Oscar was sitting at his desk waiting to call Marissa. This is this is her mess. He thought she called. She called me and wanted me to come over. We didn't do anything. Couldn't that be the problem too? He he looked at he looked at the papers at his desk. Then he turned to look at the phone, hoping it would ring. Marissa Marissa Oliver, MD. How stupid could you be? He's he's your employer. So this is about she she actually had a little bit too much to drink, called him on her cell phone, and went over there. And he had been anticipating her showing up and got nervous and started drinking also. And what happened was they fell asleep arm in arm and nothing happened. And now he's worried that nothing happened that should have happened, but then shouldn't have happened. And she's worried because that's her employee, mm -hmm. employer. And so she's, there's a lot of back and forth here um, about them trying to get together, then getting together, then maybe should they stay together or not stay together and then she realizes she has no choice. She has to be with him. And you'll have to read the rest of it for the secret yes, why she has to yes. <laughs> Okay. What, what's your favorite and least favorite part about the publishing journey? Oh, God. Um, getting through it is the least favorable. Getting it started, getting, um, 
it's it's an interesting inroad and I've learned so much, but the hardest part about it is the learning process of it. And what you're getting for what you pay for, or if you get an agent and then go on to be published traditionally, um, there's there's a lot of avenues now, and I'm actually considering um, changing avenues. I went with a hybrid publisher this time, um, and it, it was mascot books, and they're they're not bad. You know, there there's nothing wrong with them. Um, it's just I have a lot of high expectations. I do a lot of research on something before I move forward, and so when I would when I would call them and say I'd like to do this or I'd like to do that. Sometimes I was handcuffed, especially when it came to like running my own Amazon ads or my own um, promotions and things like that, because they have the ISBN number and um, that makes it more difficult. I will recommend to anybody who's going to go with a, a vanity or a hybrid publisher, or indie, indie small print publisher, um, retain all the rights for your book. That's the one reason I went with Mascot. I own all my own rights to my book. If you wind up going with a traditional publisher, I believe that's not going to be the case, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of advantages to going that way also. Um, and I, I don't want to get into that, but as far as the, as the, um, the publishing of it, make sure if you're not going to go traditionally, you own, you own all the rights. Um, because I think that's very important um, because your contract with a vanity publisher is a very limited time. And then what happens is what do you do then if you don't own rights to the book? So if you own the rights, then you can do whatever you want with it. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. How did you come up with the title Green Haven? <laughs> that is kind of funny because this book had about three or four different titles. The original title for this book was, um, um, oh God, Peaceful Mercy. And, and Peaceful Mercy just didn't, didn't fit it after a while. And it was actually a lot of conversation. It was my wife who came up with the title. Mm. She actually came up with Green Haven. She, she actually designed the cover. Um, oh wow! And uh, oh yeah, she's a, she's an architect, and she's and and she can she can design very very well. Um, that is the one part that I really am failing in, is designing the covers and, and coming. Up. I had no idea. We went through so many different cover designs and um, and titles and. Um, Broken Promises was another title for it, and nothing seemed to fit. And, and then Laura, my wife, said, why don't we just call it Green Haven? And I'm like, oh my God, that's so easy. Yeah, and we called it Green Haven. So, um, and I, I think it fits well. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the designing of the cover, and I don't know if you can see it out there, I'll show, hold it up, but inside here, inside here, okay, is a death certificate. Okay, inside inside the bricks. It's, and once you read Green Haven, you'll understand why the brick is broken. Okay. Um, once you get through the whole book. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But uh, oh I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, how did you come up with the character names for the story? That I I like I was saying earlier, the names for me are are either they come up or like this and right away. In, you know, as they're talking to me, mm -hmm. or um, I wind up like laboring over them because I don't want names that uh, that are names of people that I know or close to that. The other thing, I, I play a game with myself. I try not to name characters starting with the same letter in, every, in, in each name. So, you know, it, it's it, it's part of my creative process, but they kind of tell me their names. Like, I guess you can say because I really didn't have much difficulty after a while picking names. Okay. Are there any books or authors that inspire you to become an author? Um, you know, it's funny because I I read a lot of John Grisham, some Robert Pattinson, 
uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not Robert Patterson. That's the he's the he's, he's the uh, actor. <laughs> um, uh, Dan Brown. Um, I, I tend to like um, more modern day stuff. Um, and you know, I've always thought to myself, can I do this? You know, it's funny. I'm just thinking about it. You asked me when I began to be a writer, and I and I will I'll give you a quick funny story about that. I actually started writing a, a novel, I'd say 35, 40 years ago. It's on floppy disk somewhere. Okay. Can you remember what a floppy disk looked like? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's, it's lost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's no way to ever find that one again. But, and I don't know where the floppy disk is even. So. Oh, goodness. What are you currently working on right now? Um, I'm currently working on two novels right now. One of them is pretty much done and it's called Standards of Care. It's about a doctor, a young doctor, again, staying in my lane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's about a young doctor who opens up an office in a low income area. And she finds out that the, the, her patients have to choose between medical care or their medicines and taking care of their family. And so she decides to come up with these creative ideas in her office to try and help them. And it starts working really well, too well, and someone calls the government and the government comes in and puts her on trial for tax evasion and some other things that go on in the story. And even though the story is about the, the doctor and the patients around her, there is some trial stuff that goes into the story, but mostly it's about the characters and how she, takes how she goes from this young naive doctor to growing into her own power and even as the attorney who's defending her is broken he heals from it and he he comes through it um and the story has maybe five or six or seven characters in it uh, but there's some inanimate characters that that are play just as important part uh, and it's funny because i didn't think that inanimate objects could be characters, but there's a there's a there's a, a diner mm -hmm. across from the courthouse that kind of takes on its own life in the story, and and there's always certain parts in every one of my stories that I write and I cry. I end up crying after I wrote it, and because they're so emotional to me. And both Green Haven and Standards of Care have parts in that, that even when I still read them now, make me cry a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if I'm attaching other emotion to it or not, but it is what it is. The, the second story I'm working on now is, um, is called Lunchtime PI. And originally I started writing it as a short story to submit for an award. Oh, Queenie, I found out I can't write short stories. It just starts, it, it just starts to grow. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what was, turning, what was starting out to be a 5,000 word short story is now up to about 14,000 words. Okay, and I'm just getting started. Mm -hmm. But um, Lunchtime PI is about a, an older woman who works for a private detective and he doesn't pay her to go to take lunch. And he winds up getting this case. This is going to be a series. And he, he winds up getting a case that he's totally not qualified to take. And so she starts solving it in her lunchtime. And she starts finding the clues. And, and it's, it's my first time, time period piece. It takes, a, it takes place in the 1960s. And so it's been fun researching all the, um, all the little nuances and quirks that take place in the 60s to make it fit into there. Um, but it's, it's been a fun story. That one, um, I may publish as my second novel first um, uh, before the, before the uh, standards of care. Mm -hmm. I haven't decided yet. Now, those are exclusives for you because no one has, no one's known any about those two yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How can readers find you and your books? They can find me on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. uh, Books a Million, 
just about anywhere you just type in Green Haven by Luca Di Matteo. You can go on my website, luca-dimatteo.com uh, and order it directly from me. You can order it from mascotbooks.com. Um, it, it's on Goodreads, uh, BookBub. Um, just about, I, 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 we managed to put it everywhere. So um, the great thing, you, since you're asking me about that, it's, it's a lot of fun to, when you sell a book um, internationally. <clears throat> and I've sold in Canada, Ireland, um, Italy, uh, um, Spain, and, um, and, and India, which that was a fun, that was fun when I came up. So, um, so it, it's been, it's, it's been a fun road. Congratulations, international author. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, show your book one more time. Sure. Okay, Greenhaven. And is there anything else you would like to add before we close? Yes, I would. I would like to thank you for doing this. And uh, I think what you're doing is great. I went through uh, YouTube and watched some of your videos and stuff like that. And I, I think you should be very proud of yourself. I thank, really you. Um, thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to be following you and watching some of those. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. This is Queenie Clem with Queenie's Book Talk and Reviews. Happy reading. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.